then hit the 50 mark and then start. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I mean, I hope you had a good AHA. You know, it was a great meeting. Again, the virtual format makes it challenging to actually appreciate. But congrats to all the presenters from our section and all the great science that was presented there. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Wiley join us this morning. He's a professor of medicine in Columbia. Um, he's the director of Irving Institute of Clinical and Translational Research. He's the associate dean for clinical and translational research and the director of the Cardiometabolic Precision Medicine Program. He completed his medical school at the University College of Dublin in Ireland and his residency and fellowship in the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Uh, he leads the Riley Group at Columbia uh, Irving Medical Center, which is dedicated to translational and genomic studies of human cardiometabolic disorders uh, with expertise in preclinical cell and rodent models, as well as with human functional genomics and epidemiology. The group is composed of vet lab, computational and clinical scientists integrated across the translational spectrum in defining the mechanisms of complex cardiovascular and metabolic disorder. We're really excited to have him present to us. He's presenting translational genomics and cardiovascular disease, and I'll turn over the mic to you. Thank you. Great, can you hear me okay? And you can see the screen? Yes. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. It's great to, to visit, uh, even if remotely, and see some familiar faces and new ones too. Um, continue to make connections for sure. <clears throat> Today, um, let me see if I've skipped. Yeah, so my group, you know, is is on the clinic basic laboratory genetics translational to clinical science. So, um, some of the work I'll present today is is um, on that basic translational side. The lab works overall a, a lot currently on single cell approaches uh, to uh, myeloid biology um, in atherosclerosis and the, from human discovery also in mouse models. And <clears throat> we have a particular emphasis long non coding RNAs, these types of RNA molecules that are regulatory and often conserved or non-conserved human primate specific. Um, and the last area we do a fair bit of work on is on genes related to atherosclerosis that relate to smoothness cell function biology. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. That'll be the focus, Adam TS7, and, and then some newer work on smoothness cell cells as well. Um, so kind of one question that, you know, is worth posing to ourselves from a clinical perspective, as we think about the disease of atherosclerosis in our current times and is well, what is the disease? Is it, is it as we know, a mechanical disorder? Is it a, is it really fundamentally a lipoprotein disorder? And without that problem, it's not a disease at all. Or is it really an inflammatory disease, and everything else is kind of you know just part of the backup system? Um, or is it thirty years ago the work that really um, emphasized the role of smoothness cell in the vascular wall and the endothelial cells? And we know that mice models don't recapitulate human plaque rupture and thrombosis. So really, is this just a thrombotic disease? Is that the main, is that the main thing that's going on? Or is it, is it something else? Is it actually cancer? Is it somatic mutations of myeloid and blood-derived cells and, and clonal hematopoiesis and CHIP syndromes that we know increase the rate of cardiovascular disease, particularly in the elderly? So what is atherosclerosis? And you know, despite 50 years or more of work <clears throat> in this area, maybe 70 years, um, it's a conundrum, and despite describing these plaques over, you know, 150 years ago, it still represents a big challenge to understand what it is and how to use that knowledge towards therapies. And particularly at a time when we think that we've solved most of the problems and can really lower lipids, but we still have a very large aging population on extremely low, with extremely low lipids that die from cardiovascular disease. And in fact, that's reversed in terms of trends in the last decade or so, particularly in, in uh, the elderly and in some uh, uh, diverse groups. <clears throat> so the traditional model we often think about when we have a, a picture of atherosclerosis is we think about, well, there's elevated lipoproteins and they are exposed to the endothelium and the endothelium is activated either by the lipoproteins or cigarette smoke or oxygen damage, diabetes and hypertension and this activates adhesion molecules which will recruit myeloid cells particularly, but also T cells and lipoproteins pass through the endothelium and the gap junctions into the subendothelium. And this combination creates this foamy cell or this macrophage activation with uptake of lipids. And some of these are inflammatory and some of them are, are protective. And we know that there's a lot more macrophages uh, types in the blood vessel wall than we previously kind of thought. It's not a, a, an M1, M2 story. It's a continuum of multiple types that seem to actually recapitulate other types of diseases, such as 
Alzheimer's disease and <clears throat> fatty liver at the time and, and, and obese uh, dysfunctional adipulse as well, the types of macrophage dysfunction or abnormalities that are found there. But one fundamental response is that early in disease, smoothness of cells in the media respond to this stress and react to it by de-differentiating and stopping contractile and migrating and proliferating. And it can be a good thing to form the, because they increase the, the amount of fiber cells and formation of the fibers cap with active two positive cells. But maybe they're doing some bad things as well. And this is an area of great focus in the last few years, particularly as genetics has pointed us back to the blood vessel wall a bit more um, than we have been focused maybe 20 years ago. <clears throat> and to speaking of human genetics, you know, at this point, <clears throat> there's well over 150 loci in the genome discovered at genome-wide association studies going back over the last 15 years now, starting with 9P21, but many, many loci in the genome for coronary heart disease is a complex trait. Um, and there's probably somewhere in the range of, you know, 250 to 300 that are true and positive at a level of um, enrichment and, and uh, eventually will be proved out. And these will fall into certain categories of pathways, but it is a lot of the a lot of areas in the genomes and they do reflect <clears throat> new knowledge. Less than 25% of these loci have been linked in any way through genetics to lipids, hypertension, or known risk factors. Uh, most of these are unresolved in terms of mechanism and function. The majority are un not understood. And it's hard to go after that larger number. So putting them into buckets of pathways and functions that come with genetic and genomic knowledge is useful. Um, so some of this is that, you know, when you look at where they're expressed and how they have a relationship to expression in tissues, the various genetic variation, there's a set that do relate to the blood vessel wall, smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, and matrix. Um, and particularly, there's more than we would have expected, perhaps, that relates to the smooth muscle cell and matrix biology. There's also a whole bunch that relate to inflammation and immunity, but a lot of these are a little bit different than what we have been studying or are really pushing on in mouse models for over 20, 30 years. And it's not always the same genes we thought would be the most important, um, but many of the pathways and many of the immune, innate immune, adaptive immune phenotypes, et cetera, are, are conserved at some level. <clears throat> so a lot of these pathways illuminate new areas of biology to pathophysiology we knew, but a lot of these areas, we don't really know what they relate to exactly. They may fall into these categories or they, they may uh, light up in newer areas. So we have to keep an open mind to that. And of course, more recently, we've identified that somatic mutations, acquired mutations that occur in blood derived cells, uh, clonal matapoiesis is in fact probably causal. And there's a lot of strong work from Yale and other, uh, other major centers in the US on this that show that um, blood cells, particularly myeloid cells, that have these somatic mutations, precancerous mutations actually are abnormal and it create inflammatory dysfunctional environments in the blood vessel wall that accelerates clinical disease as well as in mouse models. And that's really interesting because it brings in the ideas of cancer types of mechanisms and molecular therapies that are precision therapies that we um, really would want to be thinking about as we move into the future potentially. So going back over a long time, maybe 15 plus years. I started out when I was very young working on uh, biobanks and trying to get material from uh, our cath labs, et cetera, into biobanks early days. And, but we did have a few, several thousand people and we started to do GWAS studies uh, you know, at a time when some people were doing it and we were lucky enough to learn as we went. And at the time in the mid 2000s to later 2000s, um, we did a GWAS of coronary angiographic based disease when I was a pen and worked very closely with Dan Rayner in particular, but others too. And this was a kind of a collaborative effort across the cath labs. Um, <clears throat> and we did two types of studies, which I still think are informative from a clinical perspective. We did a study on the left, which was relating in about 20,000 subjects, whether there was angiographic disease versus no angiographic disease. And we realized how biased and flawed that is it's because you know, the no angiographic disease folks have some disease and the angiographic disease you know, is not always the same, but there's an extreme difference in the amount and burden of atherosclerosis in these phenotypes. So this is really a, a study, <clears throat> a case control study of atherosclerosis, coronary atherosclerosis. And then we did a study in about 10,000 subjects of those who had coronary angiography matched for risk factors whether they had a history of MI or not. This was really a, a, a study of genetics of complications, plaque rupture and thrombosis, myocardial infarction in the setting of existing disease. <clears throat> and what we found is the genetic signature of this was quite different from the genetic signature of this. And our top finding for atherosclerosis was a, G, a locus called Adam TS7. And our top finding for um, myocardial infarction 
um, was the ABO blood group locus, which actually was a rediscovery of something that was known for like 100 years at some level and, and, and for 50 years at least from epidemiological studies, but largely ignored. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but the ABO biology for thrombotic diseases is very interesting in that we don't fully understand the mechanisms, but it is a glycobiology modification, probably on the surface of proteins and in the endothelial cell. But it does point to the fact that this locus really reflects that plaque rupture thrombotic pathway. And the genes for that still remain different to those for atherosclerosis. And we have understudied this area in the last 15 years, to be honest. And we've kind of done a lot of work on the atherosclerosis side, prioritized. So when we <clears throat> were doing this, uh, GWAS at the time pretty quickly afterwards, we were a consortium. And, you know, the consortium confirmed the presence of these two with a larger set of people, around 50,000 people at the time. And obviously 9P21 was in this study. So these were the locus in a plot above a certain statistical threshold at the time in 2011. If there's 250 or 150 of these things now, this was in the 20s at the time. But you can see that we had Adam TS7 and ABO and many other interesting ones, including lipoprotein related ones, PCSK9, TCF21 for thrombotermesis and the smoothness of cells involved there, Factor one still a conundrum, could be endothelial, could be macrophages, LP little A's in there, LDL receptor, collagens, and then some inflammatory factors too. So at the time, and since then, and two colleagues of mine, uh, Huizé who's coming through really now as, as uh, an instructor level at, at Columbia and Rob Bauer, who's a uh, faculty at Columbia and was at Penn for a while with Dan Rader um, and recruited up to Columbia, have worked on this project over a period of time. And I'll just talk about it briefly. Adam TS7 is very interesting in that it's one of a uh, super family of over 21 genes with Adam TS-like genes and other 10 or so or more. And they're very interesting in that they've got very large proteins where protease domain, and unlike MMPs, which kind of stop at this area, which is the MMP protease domain, they've got a very large C-terminal expansion, which has got all sorts of things in it um, <clears throat> that help it to be localized and help it to be uh, target its function. And Adam TS7 in particular is mucin domains that make it very sticky, that sticks to the cell surface membrane. The most famous of the Adam TS family is Adam TS13 von Wilbur protein. It's really uh, protease, but it's very, <clears throat> it's targeted von Wilbur in fact, protein. And it's the protease for that. And what's really interesting about it is because of a C-terminal domain, Adam TS13 is only one known true substrate von Willmann factor, and it's the cause of a very important genetic disorder. So because of their complexity of the C-terminus, they appear to be very directed in their enzymatic activities, unlike general MMPs. And therefore, they're very targetable, potentially. And we know that Adam TS7 really only has one or two substrates. In fact, we don't really understand the substrates very well, and that's part of our interest. And so this is what it looks like, a very big protein, the um, pro domain, the metalloprotease domain, and these TSP repeats, and these mucin domains, particularly the TS7, TS12. And this is the long name, and there's now over 20 members. And it was known when we identified as a GBOS locus for atherosclerosis to uh, report it to cleave cartilage oligomeric matrix protein, which is actually expressed in the blood vessel wall and made it a very interesting target. But it's also expressed in bone arthritis. And most of the studies that have examined the substrates in unbiased ways of Adam TS7 have not found comp to be its substrate, or at least the substrate in the blood vessel wall. So this is obviously something that takes years to actually prove a negative, and that was something that the field did for five or six years. But it does cleave it, but it's not efficient, and it doesn't be um, relevant to um, what happens to the blood vessel wall. And we do know that overexpression of Adam TS7 was shown prior to our work to modulate smoothness of cell migration. And that was something where, therefore, it gave us a focus to think about. It also is expressed in smoothness cell and endothelial cells, but not in blood cells, only in endothelial and, and, um, and smoothness cells. It is expressed in the heart, it is expressed in the brain. We don't really know what it does there. So one of the things we did early on was we knocked out the gene in a mouse model. And Rob Bauer led this work. <clears throat> And because it's a smooth vessel gene, this is a bit like instant restenosis, restenosis and stent work. We kind of did a vascular injury model to see if it had a classic response and if it could modulate the response to vascular injury, which is largely a smooth vessel driven process after the endothelial activation. And sure enough, at 28 days, knocking out this gene really blocks the response to wire injury in a, in a mouse model. Really it blocked the stenosis and the neointima formation. Presumably by affecting either migration or proliferation or matrix secretion or all facets, this phenotype switching of the smoothness cells, if you will. At the same time, we bred up our mice into APOE and LDL backgrounds, and in both APOE and LDL, we were able to show that it had a fairly significant reduction atherosclerosis when you knocked out this gene. 
So that here's the, the data shown for the APOE mice with reductions in males and females across three cohorts and fairly large numbers that are reproducible, both the aortic root non fast And so all this work's published several years ago. But this led us to understand that at least in a mouse model, if you knock out or block this gene from a genetic perspective, you block atherosclerosis substantially, and you also block the faster response to injury, suggesting smooth muscle cells are involved in that process. So what about the human genetics? Well, what we had found was that there was SNPs at the locus near the, in the gene itself, actually, um, uh, one variant, which was a coding variant, common coding variant, which is thought to be functional and has been studied by one group in the UK and shown some functional effects in smooth muscle cells. But most of the strength of the signal was in the regulatory areas upstream on the five prime side of the gene. And these had EQTLs where the variation in this seemed to be associated with change in expression of Adam TS7 in different tissues. Complicated as it turns out, but it pointed to this gene as being probably the, the associated gene target for these SNPs that are associated with the disease. So that was the area where it was found. And when you look at this area extensively, uh, you find a significant amount of epigenetic marks. And these are the these are the regulatory marks that suggest enhancers and promoter areas where transcription factors are binding to regulate the expression near genes. And there's a large map of, <clears throat> of uh, regulatory areas around this gene that we were looking at, which overlapped SNPs as well. So in that context, we were um, looking at multiple evidence that the SNPs in a certain area will be associated with a regulatory feature would be associated with areas where transcription factors that were involved in smooth cell biology were binding and were, were at regular features of smooth muscle cells or endothelial cells. And using all of that evidence, we selected areas of the genome. Uh, we use a pan a few years ago, started to knock these areas out by <clears throat> CRISPR technology in smooth muscle cell lines, human smooth muscle cell lines, and then was doing so to knock out the, the SNP itself and the binding areas around the SNP. So in this case, he picked four areas. He used uh, human iPS cells to stimulate and differentiate them in protocols that are well established to either smoothness cell type or endothelial cell type. And then he studied the effect of the loss of, of each of these areas which contain the SNPs associated with the regular features and the expression of the gene, Adam TS7, to test this idea that they were regulating um, the expression of the gene and the function of the gene. And it turned out there was two of these areas that one is shown here that when you uh, knocked out that region, you could see there was a reduction in Adam TS7 expression in smooth muscle cells, but there was no reduction when you knocked the same area out and you made an endothelial cell, suggesting that was a smooth muscle specific regulatory feature overlying the SNPs. And at this case, we have two of these areas that are fairly good, strong candidates for regulatory regions where it looks increasingly like manipulation of an enhancer region is what the SNP is doing and in affecting the expression of Adam TS7 and smooth muscle cells. At the same time, we continued to try and look for human, uh, rob more robust human genetic evidence for um, this locus. But this was a coincidental study where our colleagues that were involved in cardiogram plus D4D were performing a large scale attempt at doing a, a, an environmental factor interaction with human genetics for coronary artery disease. So we had somewhere in the range of 150,000 subjects at this up in the cardigan plus C4D consortium of coronary artery disease and controls. And we asked the question of if you smoked or ever smoked or were an ex-smoker or an active smoker, um, was there an interaction with the genome? And we started by just looking at the established loci at the time, which was around you know, 30 to 40 at that time to see if there was an interaction as well as doing an exploratory genome-wide study. And one of the first things we found was that previous, we had enough power to show negative results that were previously positive. So things like the APOE locus, which had been published on as a potential genome interaction for smoking and outcomes was not positive, no matter what way we looked at it. Um, <clears throat> and many things that were previously reported were negative. But we did find coincidentally not, not expecting it at the time, that the strongest locus in the genome of the known ones that had been identified for GOS coronary disease by 2015, in fact, was Adam TS7, which is kind of interesting. But what it looks like was this, this is if you were a, a never smoker, this was a strong signal at this locus. And this signal for the SNPs was a protective one. In fact, the SNPs that have strong signals here are associated with lower risk of disease. Whereas if you were a smoker in the you had actually no signal at all of the region. So the SNPs did not associate with disease. And we found that these SNPs um, in the presence of atheros and the presence of smoking extract on smooth muscle cells, that, that smoking extract increases the expression of Adam TS7 and obliterates the uh, 
negative regulation of the SNP on the expression in smooth muscle cells. So the idea is, is that if you don't smoke, this SNP affects the expression of the gene. But if you're a smoker, there's already a very strong stimulation of this gene, which occurs in smooth muscle cells, and the SNP effect maybe not be as strong. Um, <clears throat> so that, that work actually led to some interesting ideas that this might be particularly uh, a risk pathway in smokers um, um, compared to non-smokers. So there's a lot of work going on here. The human genetics are very complicated. As I look at Ari there, I can realize he's saying, well, what about human knockouts? What do they look like? And it turns out that this locus has five pseudogenes, three in the region. And it has been possible through short read sequence to actually map loss of function mutations with fidelity. And um, so long read sequencing and long range QPCR approaches are needed. And we've done some of that work. And compared to what's in public databases, that are out there where you will find that there's apparently 60, 70 loss of function variants, heterozygous present in public databases at this locus. And um, what you see is that there's actually very low quality control reads at this locus in most public data for short reads. And most of those variants are not in the gene itself when you do longer reach sequencing. So we don't really know what a loss of function mutation at this locus is. And we're working with Dinesh Salaheen in the Pakistani genomic resource specifically because they have an enrichment because of first cousin marriages for homozygosity to look for authentic mutations and then study them in the big promise study that he's done there. And, and that's something we're working on. It's taken us years actually, which is kind of very painful, but it's fun. Um, so what we know at this stage is that Adam ts 7 is a novel gene for human coronary artery disease and it's expressed in arterial smoothness cells and endothelial cells. And our work suggests smoothness cells are probably one of the ways it works to have its effects. But I think this is an open question. It is expressed in endothelial cells. There's some work done in endothelial cells that suggests that it has functions in endothelial cells. And in fact, we're not convinced that it's endothelial cells or smooth muscle cells where it has its effects in early atherosclerosis where we think it seems to work. Um, there are regulatory regions which contain the SNPs that are seem to regulate smooth muscle cell expression. Human EQTLs are present for this gene, but are quite confusing because they're tissue specific and vary depending on the tissue and cell you're looking at and has been a source of confusion. We don't know what a loss of function looks like in a human. We know what a loss of function looks like in a mouse, which is encouraging, but it doesn't really prove that that's what happens in a human. We do know from the broad group, uh, Patrick Allner and his other and colleagues, say Catherine Reeson, who worked on this before he left for um, um, fair, fair activities more recently, have shown that the um, effects of this gene in mouse models and effects in cells require the, meta, the a catalytic domain of Adam TS7. So we think it's a targetable catalytic domain that could be druggable because these are hard to drug, but they are specific when drugged, uh, unlike other MMPs. So this is really something that's still active in terms of therapeutics, but just very complicated. No company has taken the leap to try and develop a program without more of the human genetics in place, I believe. Um, and so we'll continue to work on that gene. <clears throat> but just moving back to where I'd started from, like, a lot of the genes that lit up in the early GWASs and continue to light up are genes and pathways that regulate smooth muscle cell and matrix biology. And these include collagens and MTS7. TCF21 is a super interesting one, which regulates um, coronary artery development. Tom Quatermus has shown that years ago, and then has come back to look at this much more extensively with GWAS studies and has led the field in this area. But TCF21 is a transcription factor that regulates um, you know, um, fibroblast formation, but it also regulates um, like when you shut it off, you allow the formation of coronary arteries, coronary smooth muscle cells. And in GWAS studies, um, this seems to have an association with coronary disease. And he has done some work which suggests that TCF21 variation that increase expression may decrease coronary artery disease just from the EQTL patterns. Um, so that's an interesting thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But PDGF and others have lit up in GWAS studies, pointing to the vessel wall. So we decided to look at this with the perspective, going back to the old days, not of this uh, macrophage or myeloid cell, which I'm interested in, and not of the T cell perspective of the, of the Hansons and Libby's of the world, if you will, and, and, and not <clears throat> the endothelial perspective, the cesses of the world, are not the lipoprotein perspective of, of um, you know, many of the leading people in the world who've really transformed this disease, including my colleague Dan Rader and others, Helen Hobbs, et cetera. And, 
But from the perspective of smoothness of cells, which goes back a long time in thinking about this in disease. So the idea is that smoothness of cells migrate out, as we said earlier, into form of fibrous cap, but they may be also doing other stuff. They may be making other types of cells. So how did we go about this? Well, we want to ask the questions of what types of cells are derived from smoothness of cells during atherogenesis? How do they change during atherogenic stress? And what is the effects of modulating smooth muscle cells and their tr transitions? Um, so this is work done again by Huizia Pan, and then a talented bioinformatician, Chen Yi Zhu, and then my colleague, Ming Yao Li, uh, is at the University of Pennsylvania, a computational person, Alex Bashor, postdoc in the lab currently. We're interested in single cell genomics and fate mapping of vascular smooth muscle cells in mouse atherosclerosis and in humans, so that we could understand cell-based mechanisms of disease, like are certain smooth muscle cell derived cells doing good things and are certain ones doing bad things? And what can we learn about that? Because that could be something that's very interesting to be thinking about treatment at a time when the LDL levels are hammered down to 70 or 60 and somebody's 17 years old and they have pre-existing disease. Well, what do you do next? Are we going to use IL-1 beta modulation? Well, we haven't gone there after Cantos, have we? So what are our choices to lower risk for that person to make them live to 95 or 90 in a healthy way? And one of the ways is probably to be modulating blood vessel wall as well as inflammatory pathways directly. So these are the kind of questions, residual wit risk, the vessel wall beyond lipoproteins. And it's also important in thinking about, I think, processes of stabilization of plaque, the fibrous cap and regression of plaque. So these are really unanswered questions in terms of what smooth muscles are doing in you know, clinically relevant models. So what we did here is a, a, a kind of a classic mouse experiment, and <clears throat> I am not a mouse geneticist, so I always um, try to keep this very simple. But essentially, using Crelox technology, we knocked in a ZS green, a green marker, into the MYH11 locus, which is a very smooth muscle cell specific locus. And unfortunately, this mouse is a male only model because it's on the X chromosome. So we've had the difficulty doing these mouse uh, experiments in female mice, and that's a huge challenge in the field of general because the ones that are available for doing smooth muscle cell with specific studies in. Uh, Male and female, as Kathleen has pointed out, SM22 or Taglin is perhaps not the best one to target smooth cells because it's leaky and it has its own problems and it's expressed in other cells too. So there's a, a need in the field and it's emerging to get better mouse genetics for um, smooth muscle cell. But this allows us to fate map or lineage trace. So if a cell was a smooth muscle cell at any point early in life, and then becomes different, trans-differentiated or loses expression of smooth muscle markers, it still remains green. So we know where it came from. We always know it was originally a smooth muscle cell. And that's the point, is to understand during disease, all these cells that have converted to something else, what, if they're still green, we know they came from tumors. So what are they now? What do they look like? So this is uh, evidence before the Western diet of the aorta of a mouse, where we can see the ZS green, and it's not expressed elsewhere. And we see the active two smooth muscle cells and co-localization. And this is pretty typical. And all the controls here, we don't see the green showing up in blood cells. We don't see the green showing up in other cells. It's a very specific type of marker in this mouse model, and we've published this. And the experiment we did was we actually crossed in the LDL receptor deficient mouse and put the mice on Western diet <clears throat> over 26 weeks, which is a very long experiment, but we collected at zero time, eight weeks, 16 weeks, and 26 weeks. So incrementally progressive disease to see what would happen with smooth muscles over time. A, a very descriptive experiment, if you will. And we digested the aortas and we separated our green cells from non-green cells. And we did single cell genomics and we took the cells and we made sure they were single and we made sure they were alive. And then we took green and we took the non-green and we got rid of anything that was slightly green, which is only a two or three or three or 4% of cells, but we had green cells and non-green cells in this experiment. So when you look at the clustering at single cell, this is very crude and it often confuses people to look at, but essentially when you're doing two-dimensional mapping of the kind of clusters of these cells, you can see here that there's macrophages over here and there's some T cells here, and this is their gene expression clustering. Based on gene expression, these cells are macrophages or they're T cells. And here's the smooth muscle cells up here, and here's the endothelial cells. And then you can see that when we put all of the data together across all of the time points, there's a lot of other cells too. And there's some intermediate cells, we've called them, and I'll come back to this SEM thing. There's some fibroblast types here. There's a, a major population of smooth muscle cells, a minor population of smooth muscle cells, pretty reproducible finding for smooth muscle cells and single cell technology. And then with these things, we call more fibrochondrocytes. And this is a continuum. When you start here, you've got a lot of smooth muscle markers, you've less of them here, and you've almost none of them down here. And you know these ones are losing smooth muscle markers and gaining other types of genes. And you can see that that 
green cells are very rich in smooth muscle cells, but there's a lot of green cells in the intermediate side of things and in the minor smoother cells and in the fibrochondrocytes, less in, in fibroblasts, none in T cells really, but there is some in the macrophage pool green cells in the macrophage pool. So what does that look like over time separated by green and non-green? Just bear with me on this one. On the bottom is, on the top is the no green. So you can see there's, you know, really no real smooth muscle cell, large numbers in this case, but there's some macrophage. These are presumably resident macrophages at time zero. And that pool expands over time. You get a lot of macrophages over time in this disease. And that's expected at eight weeks, you should be getting a lot of recruitment of monocytes to form macrophages, as well as perhaps proliferation of the resident macrophages. And your fibroblasts that are in the adventition in the blood vessel wall, and they continue to be present. And you have expansion of no T cells, T cells, more T cells, a lot of T cells over time. And the T little cells are up in this fraction, obviously, as well. What happens to smooth muscle pool? Well, most of the smooth muscle pool at baseline are classic smooth muscle cells. And there's minor and major. And there's some that have less contractile expression of their proteins at baseline. Eight weeks, you know, these are LDL mice, so some of them are not entirely normal. But over time, you see that the smooth muscle cells actually probably fade a little bit. And this is kind of consistent with what we understand. There's a loss of some medial smooth muscle population. But there's a large expansion of this intermediate pool as well as this pool of down here fibrochondrocytes. And these are losing smoother cell markers and becoming more stemmy like cells and fibrous like cells along the way. And what also you see is there's no macrophages at baseline. There shouldn't be. These are smooth muscle cells. These are green origin. But hey, look at this. By 16 weeks, there's an explosion by 26 weeks in green macrophage type cells by transcription. These are very similar in the transcription profiles. And these are green, all of them. Smoother cell origin, it appears. So what does that look like when we think about macrophage-like cells? If we take all the green cells and we sort out CD11B, which are macrophage markers, the classic macrophage markers, of all green cells by 16 to 26 weeks, about 10 to 15% of all green cells are macrophage in time. However, if you just look at macrophage cells, by 16 weeks, 40% of macrophages are green and maybe over half by 26 weeks are green. So this is kind of a suggestion that some of these cells may have converted from a smooth muscle cell right through a spectrum of intermediate cells over to a macrophage. And we know this work is being done by others in a more candidate traditional way. And, and this may be controlled by KLF4, for example. So what are, the, what are the interesting things about these cells? Well, they lose all their smooth muscle markers and some of them are shown here. The smooth muscle markers are hot, blue or markedly downregulated. They upregulate complement, chemokines, inflammatory markers. But three genes that are really highly upregulated in this pool of cells include VCAM1, LY6A, which is a stem cell markers, and LY6C, which is a monocyte marker. So we call these SEM, stem cell entity, and monocyte type cells as intermediate cells that are multi- potent at some level when we come back and look at their properties. So they're kind of a weird cell that is a mixture of things, but they're not mesenchymal stem cells because they don't express classic mesenchymal stem cell markers. So they're smooth muscle cell derived intermediate cells that have multipotent markers. So when we look at them more carefully, they actually do express LGAL S3, which was thought to be a, a macrophage specific gene. It's not, but they do not express um, markers for stem cells that are specific stem cell markers. They're very low on these. So this is not like a classic mesenchymal stem cell. These are particular smooth muscle derived multipotent cells. They lose smooth muscle markers as shown on top. They gain fibrous type of markers like collagen and fibronectin. They also gain inflammatory markers like chemokines, as I've mentioned. And when you look at them from a pathway analysis, these cells that are intermediate and have derived from smooth muscle cells are kind of an intermediate pool. I've got evidence of <clears throat> developmental features, organism development, cardiovascular development, hematological development, immune and inflammatory cancer pathways are activated. So a lot of development, a recapitulation of earlier developmental phenotypes and including proliferative and cancer type phenotypes. So when you look at these and you isolate them and we can do so because of the markers of of the um, um, LY6A and LY6C, we can do flow cytometry and pull out green cells that express these two markers. When we do so, when we do some work ex vivo, they're quite proliferative ex vivo, but much more proliferative than non, the ones that don't express these markers that are green. So compared to smooth muscle cells, these are very proliferative cells. So the proliferative, they have the capacity, if you stimulate them with MCSF to make them into a cell that expresses CD68, which is macrophage-like. So green stimulated over time, co-localization of CD68 and green does not occur in smooth cells that are not this intermediate phenotype. 
And even though I don't show the data, we can stimulate them under the right chemical circumstances, environmental circumstances, ex vivo to fibrous type cells, or we can push them back with, <clears throat> um, with TGF beta stimulation to express higher levels of smoother cell markers. So these cells can go in many different directions, ex vivo, and we suspect that they are origin of the in vivo transdifferentiation towards macrophages and osteogenic type cells that come from smooth muscle cells. So <clears throat> when you look over time and you look over physical space at something called RNA scope at a marker like VCAM, VCAM is on endothelial cells, but when it's overlapping green in this case, it's expressed in these cells, these intermediate cells, and they start in the media and then they populate from the media out into the intima and then towards the fibers cap over time. And here's a good example of them expressing the shoulder region in particular. And they also, as in other images, come across the fibers cap and then dive over time into the intima of the, of the lesion itself. <clears throat> now, is this relevant to humans, right? Does this happen? Do we see it in humans? Hard to do because we can't easily fit map or lineage trace movements of the humans. There's epigenetic marks we can use and we do some of that. But in this case, you can use transcriptomic mapping from mouse to human. So you did sing, we did single cell profiling of carotid atherosclerosis and single cell profiling of coronary atherosclerosis, both public and our own data. This was our own data. And we took the mouse cell populations that were lineage traced and we map them transcriptomically to human. And these are the pictures of the mapping. Here's the mouse data mapped to human. Here's the human data. And this is the population of intermediate cells and fibrochondrocytes and minor smooth cells. And you can see there's plenty of human cells that have identical transcriptome features or almost identical transcriptome features as the mouse stem cells, suggesting that this is true in carotid arteries, is true in coronary arteries. We see the same profiles transcriptomically of these cells. So human lesions have cells that have these intermediate features that are likely derived from smooth muscle cells, but we haven't lineage traced them in human at this point. Now, what you can do with transcriptomics as well is you can take a cell type and compare it to another cell type with all its transcriptomes and do so not just with pathway analysis, but asking the question for genes that are turned on and genes that are turned off, does that map back to the expected regulation of a particular transcription factor or regulatory pathway? And we use a, an approach that was developed at Columbia by a colleague, Andrew Califano, of master regulatory analysis that can master uh, map master regulators of cell types compared to other cell types. And he does this in cancer a lot. So we did this <clears throat> with him. And we can see here when we looked at these intermediate cells, the stem cells versus smooth muscle cells and the transcriptome, things that were turned on or off, did they reflect a transcription factor that was regulating that stage? And we can see TGF beta is a regulator here. And we can see that PI3 kinase AKT is a regulator and STAT3. So these are not huge surprises. These are kind of known for regulation of these kind of trans-differentiation smooth muscle pathways or smooth muscle cells. But here was an interesting one. It was retinoic acid signaling pathway. It actually contains three of our top genes. And crab ep 2 is a retinoic acid binding protein 2. And this, this um, is, is blue here suggesting that there's down regulation of this pathway as you form an intermediate cell. And that kind of was interesting because we hadn't thought about retinoic acid and atherosclerosis for some time. And, you know, of course, when you think of something's new, it's actually not because people had studied this 30 or 40 years ago and we didn't really uh, dig into it till we got uh, looked at the old papers. But the interesting part is when you looked at the mice, you saw that of, of retinoic acid signaling genes, which would be genes that were binding, uh, regulated by retinoic acid binding at the, uh, at the promoter of the transcription factor or the enhancers. And um, when you took a set of genes like that, they're highly upregulated or, or they're highly regulated in smooth muscle cells versus stem cells. And when you took stable versus unstable lesions in human carotid plaques, recent strokes versus stable plaques, again, these types of genes were markedly different between the stable and unstable plaque, suggesting that that may be something a feature of unstable plaques. And in our case, we, con we make conjecture that this is related to fibers cap and the degree of smooth cell biology and stability of human lesion. But we can also see that both retinoic uh, retino acid receptor B, which is signaling um, transcription factor and alpha also are actually down-regulated in unstable disease versus stable and in advanced plaques or early plaques, suggesting that retinoic acid signaling is down-regulated during human atherosclerosis. And indeed we took a pathway approach and we mapped several hundred genes that are known to be in the either 
activation of retinoic acid signaling or downstream of retinoic acid signaling, direct binding of these genes in the genome or downstream markers. And we did it at a different layer of very stringent number of genes an expanded set of genes and a hyper expanded set of genes. But in each setting, we would find enrichment of these genes for genetic signals for coronary artery disease and large GVAL status. So there was more SNPs within those genes associated with coronary artery disease than there was in, in a background set of genes that were not in the retinal gas signaling. But none of them had super huge signals. None of them reached genomide significant, but there was dozens of genes that had 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five P values at loci across the genome. And each of these genes is known to be expressed in smooth muscle cells and were targets for retinoic acid signaling. Now this type of approach has been done by Tonko Termis for TCF21 and Gary Owens for KLF4 also, showing enrichment of those kind of gene targets, transcriptional targets within smooth muscle cells and overlapping coronary artery disease loci. Indirect associative evidence, but genetics being used in this kind of um, genomics translational way. So what we did then was we went back to the mouse and we used uh, ATRA, which is actually used in clinic for leukemia for our patients. We stimulated and the mice during an atherosclerosis experiment with this drug. And we found that in fact, this drug, which turned on retinoid acid signaling, suppressed the levels of these intermediate stem cells and slightly suppressed the number of overall stem cells, suppressed a lot the development of macrophages as shown here, CD11B positive cells, where you reduce the amount of smooth muscle derived macrophages, reduce the number of intermediate cells, kind of stopped the smooth muscle cell going over and further over. And this is a bit like if you knock out KLF4, it stops it going over. Um, if you knock out KLF, uh, TCF21, you actually push it in another direction. You push it away from forming fibrous types of cells. So when we did this and looked at the atherosclerosis, this drug in this setting reduced atherosclerosis by every measure, it increased the number of fibrous cap cells that were green derived and suggesting that it shifts away from ma green macrophages or smooth derived macrophages towards green fibrous cap cells, which are fibrous cap smooth cell derived cells. So suggesting there's a redistribution away from one pathway towards another. So this really in summary of this work, it suggests that we have using single cell genomics like other groups, we're finding that smooth cell derived cells make up you know, a very large percentage of all the cells in an atherosclerotic lesion, much more than we had thought previously. And this is true in progressing. It's also true in regressing lesions when we look more recently. That smooth cells de-differentiate and trans-differentiate in multiple cell types. They seem to go through an intermediate state, which we've called a SEM state, and Gary Owens' group is called a pioneer type state. And there's overlap of those two states. They're not perfectly identical. There may be more than one intermediate state, they may diverge early or they may diverge later. We're working on that, but it's an interesting question. We think that they actually is more than one subset of intermediate cells. And these are multipotent and they can generate, depending on the microenvironment, cells that are more macrophage or osteogenic-like or cells that are more fibrous or fibrochondrocyte-like, which may be bad on the one hand or good on the other. And human genetics supports the idea that making a certain type of cell with the genetics that we've talked about, KLF4, or TCF21, or retinoic acid signaling can push towards good and bad things and in mouse models also. So we think that these intermediate cells are targetable and manipulatable in terms of the effects on progression of disease and perhaps regression also. And in this case, we know that retinoic acid does modulate this. So therapeutically, that's an interesting thing to think about. It's not like we're going to be using ATRA in our atherosclerotic patients, but it is a drug that's available and used in clinics. And that kind of thought process can allow us to think about how to target smooth muscle cells with druggable um, um, uh, drugs that are existing for other reasons that this molecular profiling has opened up precision medicine opportunities that are different to what we previously knew. So in summary of this, just to summarize, we think that the smooth muscle cell under atherogenic stress can differentiate in an intermediate cell. Others have worked a lot on this area here, including colleagues you know well, of this early step of clonality of the expansion of one or two small populations of cells to form these intermediate cells. We're not, I'm not really sure that we can offer a lot about that area yet, but it is a very interesting area. How clonal is the expansion and what are the regulations of that clonal expansion? But the intermediate cell, once it's formed early in disease, represents a significant pool of cells that can be pushed this way or this way. And this way is just kind of towards protective types of cells that may be protecting the fibrous cap and more fibrous and Active, some of them have a little bit of active two expression in the fibrous gap. And these are more um, 
inflammatory types of cells and perhaps cells that are disruptive to the cap. In my mind, we don't really know yet if kind of the fiber chondrocytes and more osteogenic features are really good or bad. There's evidence that calcification within the cells and calcification within plaques can be good, stabilization of plaques, or bad, depending on where the calcification lies. So it's not clear to me which of these cells really are good and bad, and that will require a lot of mouse work, but also human genetics to probe out individual marks of these cell types that derive some presumptive cells. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for new discovery here, but also for therapeutic targeting of particular subsets of cells that are coming from smooth cells that contribute to stability or contribute to instability and in inflammation in the plaques. <clears throat> so this was a very nice review of uh, several papers that were published last year and really uh, from several groups and really suggested that smooth cells can come out and go in different directions towards different types of intermediate cells and have an effect on forming cells that are are perhaps more harmful and cells that are perhaps more protective. Um, but we have a lot of work to do here. In fact, I would say that we don't really understand the smoothness cell demacrophage transitions or relevance to disease at all. We don't understand if those cells, how prevalent they are, and if they are fairly prevalent in certain types of disease situations, are they trying to do good things or are they very dysfunctional macrophage type cells and are they targetable? What would it look like if we got rid of them and left authentic macrophages behind? But if you think about all the macrophage biology done for the last 30 years, if half of the cells in the lesion at some point could be smoothness of origin, it makes you think a little differently about what a macrophage is, you know, in a atherosclerotic plant. So on that note, I'll just finish by coming back to where I started, again, pushing back to a larger issue that many of the loci, most of the loci, a human genetics <clears throat> for coronary artery disease and many complex threats are unresolved. Many of them are at intergenic regulatory features. We don't fully know the genes they regulate, but when we think about pathway analysis, we often collapse it down to some new pathways, but existing pathways that point to stores, the blood vessel wall, the endothelium, the smooth muscle cell, the matrix, as well as immune cells. Now, of course, lipid loci light up, but they form less than 25% of all the loci for coronary heart disease. And given that we have very effective lipid lowering therapies and more going on in that area, LP little a, and 3 it's anti-PTL4 and 3, et cetera, and triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, for patients who have very low cholesterol levels after treatment who have established disease, the therapeutic options are really around areas, I think, in the future around inflammation, endothelium, smooth cell. And these are all downstream of major risk factors, obesity, diabetes, hypertension that are continue to be a problem in our elderly and in our high risk factor populations and in our minority populations, particularly who have underrepresented populations with high diabetes and high obesity, high hypertension. So again, I come back to this original question. What do you think atherosclerosis is? You know, I, I still don't know. I think it's everything and it's it's one thing at the same time. Right now, I'm focused a little bit on the smooth muscle side of things. And we were doing a fair bit of work on some myeloid cells, particularly non-coding RNAs. But I, did, I do think it's worth reminding ourselves that every time we think we know the disease process for a common complex disease, we get a big surprise, right? Who would have thought the clonal hematopoiesis with myeloid somatic mutations would appear to be a risk factor, particularly relevant for aging, populations for cardiovascular disease, but very strong effects for genes like traumatic mutations in JAK2VF, for example. Um, so these are, these are surprises. It's surprising also to think about the amount of impact squamous cells have on an atherosclerotic plaque. We did not anticipate that. But of course, it's lighting up biology, not just for atherosclerosis, but for aneurysms, which is a major strength of, of Yale and, and um, the group at Yale in this area is incredibly strong. And it's a privilege to come here today and and present some of our data. And I'll just finish up by thanking everybody in our group and our collaborators and Huizé in particular on some of this work. Chen Yu's been with me for years, a very talented bioinformatician, others in the group working on different aspects of this project, the graduates of the group, collaborators in Europe and elsewhere, or collaborators at Penn and at uh, MGH and, and um, Columbia, and then the funding sources also. Um, uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish with that. Perfect. Thank you. That was such a great talk. Uh, and there's so many questions. And I, I might actually just call out on people to ask their questions. Uh, Dr. Mani, do you want? Uh, Morak, that was a great talk, actually very uh, uh, kind of timing for the post-GVAS uh, analysis to understand what the mechanism is. And 
And, you know, many years ago, we actually identified a mutation in LRP6 wind signaling. And when we generated the mouse model, actually, there were Espumas cell phenotype. And I completely agree with you, these are pathogenic. But we didn't find any much of a they converting to macrophages, so inflammation. And the question I have here in your model, maybe I didn't understand, that when you use the ZS green, that was not inducible, right? So could that be also... Uh, and any event, any evidence for endo MT that you know endothelial cells? Because the moment you actually have this uh, small cell marker expressed, in this case, my in eleven, you're going to turn that to green, unless this was inducible model. I don't know if it was or not. But yeah, uh, yeah. And if um, it was, do you have any evidence for endo MT? That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, you know, we don't, we haven't, and we haven't looked, but I can comment on that in a couple of ways. The first is that uh, the, these are tamoxifen induced. Oh, okay. at, about, at about four to five weeks, five to six weeks. Um, and we see extensive induction in, in smooth muscle cells <clears throat> and we don't see induction elsewhere. And we, we it's a pretty clean model. Okay. Having said that, you know, I worry a little bit that sometimes we miss a little bit of smooth muscle cells that are continually being made slow, a small population that then are not induced to be green. And we see that non-green cells, there's some non-green cells in the lesion. More importantly, you ask a question about other sources of cells, endomt or monocyte to transformation yeah. to an intermediate cell or smooth cell like cell in the lesion or lesional cells, let's say. And Gary Owens group has done, Gary Owens has done very nice work on this. And they actually showed that it, you can see a significant contribution for both the endothelium, endomt and mono, mono MT, myeloid MT to the fibrous cap and to the lesion. However, it kind of falls apart at 16 to 20 weeks and it cannot compensate for the lack of smooth muscle origin for these cells. Um, and he estimates uh, at a in a kind of you know, dynamic way, but in a static way that about you know, 20%, 15, 20% of the cells might be coming from other sources that are in the fibrous cap, but the vast majority are smooth muscle cell origin. And if you take out smooth muscle cells and you make a lesion go late, it just kind of falls apart. The fibrous cap will not survive. But, but in the first stages, there's lots of compensation. I don't know how that's relevant, how relevant that is to the real physiology. Do you, do you get that compensation? Do you get that much happening? But there's probably a little happening. I don't believe they're probably as, as likely to contribute as we would like to think. Now, I think that we have a real problem in the field and sorting out the macrophage side. I think the digestion protocols as well as the computation protocols can give you more or less of these leukocyte origin cells. We don't see that many neutrophils, for example, when we start doing stuff. And we've looked for neutrophils a lot with Alan Tall recently, and we see them when we use certain chemicals to prevent their degradation. Um, but if you say, well, the single cell profiling represents what's in the blood vessel, it's not. It represents what's surviving after you've done a digestion and put it through floor or whatever you're doing with it. And we lose a lot of cells. So Tom could term is found very few green or smooth cell derived macrophages. And Gary Owens moved from seeing a fair few to less. And we see consistently a certain percentage when we're doing our work with this model and our digestion protocols. Um, I work very closely with Ira Tabus now, and we're trying to work out how much of a bias it could be that a green cell in the lesion represents a macrophage, is that, a macrophage that's eaten an apoptotic smooth muscle cell. And we have a certain amount of evidence that that does not occur, but we're really working on proving that at a number of levels to show that the degree of bias or the bias that might be present from Ephrastosis of an apoptotic green smooth muscle cell is not accounting for our single cell, a large part of our single cell data. Um, but having said that, I, I, I would say that we are building evidence that really, you know, we published some evidence that suggests that's not the case, but we're building more evidence in that area. But it's a, it's a messy area in the field. My personal take is we have to take out, we have to do a genetic experiment in mice to take out smooth muscle derived macrophages as an entity and see what the effect is. Um, and see if that has an impact and then really kind of work in a number of levels to understand that better. Perfect. Uh, I, Eric Snett and then Dr. Martin. First of all, Murdoch, that is uh, amazing talk, fascinating work um, that I've been following for some time. Um, I have a question um, related, I'll take you outside of the lumen of the coronary artery oh, just for a moment and have your get your thoughts on whether these intermediate cells um, fate map or do you know anything or if anyone's working on whether those intermediate cells are fate mapping into the myocardium, you know, obviously the interrelationship between these coronary um, astrosporotic um, 
processes and, and HEFPEF as an example is something that is of interest to a lot of folks. And that's my one first question, maybe a quick one. And the second one is really just to ask you to give us your perspective around uh, the enhancements in computational biology that has led your, to your work today, as well as what we should be aiming for into the future that will allow us to do this kind of fate mapping work more effectively. Well, yeah, there's two good questions. I have not um, thought a lot about um, intermediate cells derived from smooth muscle cells that end up in kind of other organal systems like the heart or <clears throat> contribute to the matrix kind of secretion cells in other situations. But obviously this the biology could be occurring in the GI tract, the GU tract, et cetera, and the, the lung, uh, the lung uh, as well. Um, uh, there's not as much work in those areas and the most models are not necessarily specific. Um, so I don't, I don't know. And we, we, we've thought about this a fair bit around the clonality and uh, early changes in smooth muscle cells into these intermediate cells that really occurs at the initiation of atherosclerosis in the media where you get really these cells either pre-exist with the potential to differentiate and, and migrate are very early. Um, I think they're probably homeostatic pre-existing cells that are present in the vessel wall, and then they respond to stress and they clonally expand to some extent. And then they, and then this is, you know, I'm speaking to people who are much more knowledgeable in this area than I am on this on the Zoom. But um, having said that, when you think about clonality and you think about proliferation, you think about DNA damage, and you think about well, are these becoming more cancer-like cells? We don't see classic, you know, um, cancer type expansions in our blood vessel walls. But I think that's, that's a naive perception of what this could look like, you know, with clonal expansion, DNA damage, and even mutations, um, somatic mutations that might occur. I think there's a lot of work to be done there to rule things out and to include things. Um, on the computation side, I'll say that you know, I'm a naivety in this, uh, a naive person in this respect, but I'm fortunate to work with good people and Ming Yao Li in particular, a colleague from Penn days stays, works with me closely still, and we do a lot of work together. But I think that, you know, a small amount of single cell data, especially cutting edge single cell data, can be computationally leveraged to integrate with a large amount of um, more common data like bulk data and ATAC seq data and, you know, other sources as well as human genetic data to decipher some of this work. And I think the computational side is actually critical. And it's one of those areas that I think we should be training our fellows. Um, and our postdocs, it should be a wet, dry combination training. <laughs> you know, if I could go back and do my training again, I know what I, I, you know what I, I know what I'm missing, but I know that what I want to get my lab to train in now, and it's actually hard because a lot of wet lab graduate students are are just not. You know, you have to get them early, I think, to get them ready for this. But I think wet lab folks are going to be trying to integrate this into their daily lives in a way that means they'll be doing much more intelligent experiments based on computational knowledge. Um, and I think on the clinical side, we can leverage this right into human genetics, GWAS, and population inference, um, I think, fairly, you know, fairly quickly. For example, um, I uh, noticed a paper from Klaus Lay and ATVB not so long ago and several others, uh, the Bike Consortium and Karlinska, where they're using technologies to actually integrate imaging of atherosclerotic plaque or imaging of the heart to map in single cell genetic data to try and look at the expression profiling from single cell and with computation approaches into the actual imaging of, of data sets. And, and you don't, you can actually break down an image with a small amount of genetic data mapped into it without having genetic data in the image population. So we'll begin to get an understanding of the actual makeup of lesions from a genomic perspective from image data alone through engineering and computation process. So I'm very excited by that. And, and um, I think that's ahead of us to, to really exploit. Thank you, that was wonderful. If we have, uh, I think if it's okay, we'll have one more question, maybe a summary of the other questions in the chat so we can have two more. Uh, I know this is an exciting conversation for a lot of members of the group. Uh, Dr. Martin, I'll let you ask questions. And if, if you don't mind, Dr. Ben or Dr. Reed and Dr. Young, so we can have your question in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again for joining us today, Murdoch. That was just amazing, beautiful work. And I'm really excited that something like single cell analysis could lead to something with therapeutic potential like the retinoic acid. And I was wondering if your single cell experiments with the retinoic acid revealed 
pleiotropic effects on other cell types, sort of your non-green, non-smooth muscle cells? Do you think there could be beneficial effects on the lesion as a whole, the endothelial, the macrophage contribution, or is it confined to the smooth muscle cells? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, first of all, buried in the paper, not buried in the paper, but in the paper, we dealt with a little bit of that off tar on target, non-smooth muscle cell effects of retinoic acid. In fact, um, retinoic acid modulates myeloid cells, endothelial cells, liver cells, and, and other cells. And it's not, therefore, something that is going to be easy to think of as you know, a therapeutic targeting when you have all those cells involved. So for example, there's data going back 20 to 30 years that shows that retinoic acid um, in mouse models of atherosclerosis affect lipoproteins through liver metabolism. And that was a confounder in our study when we did the atherosclerosis work, we found that retinoic acid had an effect on atherosclerosis, but it actually also lowered lipids a little bit. Um, so we ended up going back to do a vascular injury experiment where there's no effects on lipids and it wasn't on an LDL background. And we see this profound effect of retinoic acid blockade of, of the vascular injury response, the trans differentiation, the neointima formation. So we think that it has multiple effects on multiple organs and cells and tissue types, the liver and, and tissues for lipo, lipoproteins, uh, and then for, for certainly just movement cell, but it's well established that it signals in myeloid cells as well. We did not look at that and we have not looked at that extensively, but that's, um, that's not so, you know, genetic approaches would help us to understand that the cell specific effects. And in some cases, as we know, you can have cell specific effects that are going one direction and then the, another cell goes in the other direction for the phenotypes. And that's, that's a big challenge for this area. Perfect. We'll have one last question. Dr. Bender has basically agreed that he'll sort of reach out offline. Dr. Grief, if you want to ask the question. Okay. Um, Murdoch, that, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. It's great to see you again. Um, I was wondering, I was just try typing this in, is there insights that you can get from your human studies or there's an effort to identify whether there is clonal expansion in human lesions and um, do you have insights from your work either in the mouse or in human work that, you know, what, it seems like there's a big work. What is the, um, are there specialized smooth muscle cells in the normal wall that then are induced to expand? Um, are there, are there actually a specialized population of cells? Yeah. I mean, I think the human side is really challenging, I think, because, you know, we're able to do the simple thing. Well, we're able to do these very straightforward things, which is map the mouse cells to the human lesion, say, oh, look, they exist there. But when we look at the human lesion and we break them out, we really do have to try and find ways to, at scale and with fidelity, try to trace or lineage trace smooth muscle cells or endothelial cells to get to the human questions. Because, you know, some of the genes that we use as markers in the mouse don't exist and are not expressed in the, the human. So we're, we're left with we can't flow out these cells even if we want to. And, and so we're, we're, we're trying to think this through, but I don't think we've, we're, we're advanced in that area in the human side. I, I do think that trying to identify whether these early cells that might have this capacity or homeo, you know, homeostatic responses are, are, are that, they're, that they're kind of present in the media. They are actually down-regulating some of the smooth cell markers. They're, function is to respond to stresses, basic physiological stresses as part of normal biology. I think there probably are cells like that. The Jorgensen's group and others have shown uh, with, with um, <clears throat> the early work on the confetti mice that, and with some work ex vivo from those, that these are probably real cells and some of the work related to that that are occurring under normal circumstances. Now, a mouse that's an LDL receptor deficient mouse at eight weeks with no Western diet is still not a normal mouse. Um, and how do you get the earliest normal? And I think that's to some extent, um, physiology is not normal either, <laughs> you know, so it's dynamic, right? So, but I think these are probably um, potentially a source of the expanding cells. Now, whether this occurs in human and how much it occurs in human is, I, I think is really hard to make for sure. And I think that the mouse field will lay this one out for us. You know, you and others will lay this out for us in different areas. I think, you know, where we'll understand within certain diseases and stresses, like the degree of this expansion. I think that, you know, Diana Milwitz has done some interesting work on in vitro on PERC, for example, in the response. And I, I'm always interested in the conundrum of how PERC, which should suppress, you know, like the polyprotein response should be for suppressing proliferation in vivo, but then cells expand. So 
you know, is there some kind of DNA, DNA damage response, DNA activation response that overlaps into the unfolded protein response that then allows a certain subset of cells to escape the suppression of proliferation. And that's why they're clonal and the others are all suppressed during mm. the stress. I don't do you know. See your, do you see your intermediate cells in the media? Your yes. SDM cells? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first place at eight weeks they see with the VCAM standing and we can flow them out a little bit early stages is in the media. I see. Yeah. Thanks so much. And I, think, yeah, I think they could overlap. We're, we're doing some work with confetti now to see if we can uh, overlap the different, um, you know, the different kind of ideas that we've had, the different things. Um, and I don't think that the, the SEMs are unique. I think that they overlap with kind of the pioneer side and they overlap with the, 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 the um, you know, the early the medial cells that have been described, the Orangson group. And I don't, you know, I think there's, there's some, these are the same cells in some instances. And I think that there perhaps could be separation of sub subpopulations early that we haven't yet recognized. And that that is something that we need to get our hands on because some of them may be moving in certain directions from an early stage and they'll only go one way or they'll only go, you know, another way. But right now we have this model in our head where there's an intermediate pool that can be pushed in different directions right through later stages. I don't know how much of this population stem cells, for example, is renewed, you know, at 16 weeks is their new medial cells continuously coming out and, you know, so turning on a, 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 a tamoxifen later in the disease process would be interesting to see if you get continuous green cells, you know, emerging later in disease, um, having um, inducible um, cell specific inducible systems that would allow you to track and trace things that are turned on at, you know, later in disease. Uh, great. Thank, thank you. Uh, Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, one of our talk, very quick question. Uh, so uh, I'm fascinated by the IA signaling down regulation in a disease. So in a simple model, so in, in cell culture, if you decrease IA signaling, could you see the uh, smooth muscle cell become more proliferative and migratory to confirm your in vivo data? And for you missed example, that bit on IS. Did you say I? Excuse me, I didn't. Sorry, the, the RA or the RA. The acid signal. If you decrease RA signaling by small molecule or by SRNA in cell culture in human smooth muscle cells, will you see the smooth muscle cell become more migratory or proliferative? Yeah, we. I can't tell you that we have anything to to report on that specifically yet. You know, we we we. I, there's nothing I can say definitively on on that. It's it's a focus, but we haven't got good data on it um, from the in vitro side or the expanded in vivo side with mouse genetics. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks again. That was obviously a very uh, detailed, uh, very uh, engaging discussion. Uh, and please feel free to reach out after. Thanks again for visiting us this morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good to see you guys and hope to see you soon in person. Yeah, terrific work. Thank you.